Although the term muscular dystrophy is a broad classification term, we typically associate it with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Not surprising, this is the most common and well described of the dystrophies. But despite this, clinicians started to report on a series of other diseases with some similarities to Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but with a different inheritance pattern and distinct patterns of presentation. We now understand, with our knowledge of the dystrophin-associated glycoprotein complex, that mutations to other proteins within this complex are also likely to result in patterns of muscular dystrophy. This is where we turn our attention now, starting with a family of disorders that targets proximal muscles of both the upper and lower limbs. These are known as the limb girdle muscular dystrophies. In this session, we will describe the general presentation pattern for limb girdle muscular dystrophy, treatment options, and prognosis. We'll also identify some of the gene mutations known to cause limb girdle muscular dystrophy and how they contribute to the dystrophin-associated glycoprotein complex. In 1954, Walton and Natras reported on a class of dystrophic muscle tissues that had a distinct presentation pattern from that first described by Duchenne. As the name for this class of conditions implies, dystrophy is mostly limited to the proximal musculature controlling movements of the shoulder and hip girdles. Remember that the Duchenne muscular dystrophy is more widespread throughout the upper and lower limbs. Certain physical findings, such as pseudohypertrophy and joint contracture, is also much less common in limb girdle muscular dystrophy. There was also a delay in the onset of the disease, with symptoms first appearing in late adolescence and sometimes not until late adulthood. Progression of the disease is variable, but severe disability typically occurs 20 to 30 years following the first onset of symptoms, and in some instances will progress to include respiratory and cardiac muscle. Another notable difference is in inheritance patterns. While traditional Duchenne muscular dystrophy is exclusive to male patients, there are equal numbers of males and females affected in the new class of diseases, suggesting an autosomal inheritance pattern. Further investigation demonstrated both autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive inheritance patterns, depending on the specific gene mutation. This results in an additional level of classification. Type 1 limb girdle muscular dystrophies are inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion. These are conditions where two working copies of the gene are required for normal cellular function, either because of a deficiency in the quantity of gene product required or because the defective gene product becomes incorporated into the cell structure along with normal gene product, destabilizing the structure of the cell. Type 2 limb girdle muscular dystrophies are inherited in an autosomal recessive pattern in which a single gene product is sufficient for normal cellular function. To date, a total of 7 different forms of type 1 and 23 different forms of type 2 limb girdle muscular dystrophy have been identified. For many of the identified mutations, the pathophysiology leading to limb girdle muscular dystrophy is fairly well understood. Some of the mutations are to proteins found within the dystrophin-associated glycoprotein complex, primarily to the sarcoglycan proteins. These mutations are thought to have a similar etiology to the dystrophin mutations described earlier, causing direct disruption of the dystrophin-associated glycoprotein complex. Other mutations involve additional transmembrane proteins. Dysferlin and caviolin-3 form a transmembrane complex that is critical in the docking and fusion of repair vesicles following membrane damage. Mutation to either of these proteins will result in different forms of limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Mutations to proteins found in other regions of the muscle fiber can also result in limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Vacutin-related protein is found in the Golgi apparatus, involved in glycosylation during post-translational protein modification. It is likely that the dystrophy seen in this gene mutation results from disruption in glycosylation of proteins within the dystrophin-associated glycoprotein complex. Telethonin and myotillin are scaffolding proteins found within the Z-disc of myofilaments. Mutation to these proteins would be expected to disrupt the interaction between the myofilaments and dystrophin-associated glycoprotein complex. 
The mechanism by which other gene mutations lead to limb girdle muscular dystrophy are not as well understood. Mutations in laminin A, an intermediate filament involved in stabilization of the nuclear envelope, are associated with an autosomal dominant form of the disease, but the precise mechanism by which this occurs is not well understood. Regardless of the mutation, initial presentation is fairly consistent. At some point in late adolescence or adulthood, the patient experiences progressive weakness in muscles controlling the first the hip joint and later the shoulder joint. Workup follows a similar sequence to Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Elevated creatine kinase levels can assist with the diagnosis, especially with autosomal recessive conditions. A number of autosomal dominant forms will only demonstrate modest increases in blood CK, so negative results should be interpreted with caution. Ultrasound and MRI studies can be used to identify more severely affected muscle groups, which can provide clues to the specific mutation based on known patterns of muscle involvement, as well as identify potential muscles to be examined through needle biopsy studies. Histological analysis shows morphological changes consistent with other dystrophic conditions. Small rounded fibers interspersed with normal sized fibers, centralized nuclei and regenerating fibers, and fibrosis. Over the past few decades, immunohistochemical analysis has been of a critical importance in diagnosis for this patient group. The prevalence and characteristic presentation pattern associated with Duchenne muscular dystrophy allows for quick identification of dystrophin as the source of the mutation. As we've seen, there are numerous proteins that can be involved in suspected cases of limb girdle muscular dystrophy, which can make genetic testing more challenging. Serial sections from a needle biopsy can be taken and immunostained for various proteins known to be affected in limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Abnormal staining patterns for a particular protein can confirm a diagnosis of limb girdle muscular dystrophy and allow more focused genetic testing. Currently, NGS, or Next Generation Sequencing Based Gene Panel Testing, is now available for the diagnosis of limb girdle muscular dystrophy, and whole genome sequencing can be used in identifying de novo mutations. Combined, the frequency of limb girdle muscular dystrophy in the general population is about 5 to 7 per 1 million individuals, a rate much lower than that seen for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. This value likely underrepresents the number of true cases. Some variants may appear so late in life and progress so slowly that it never reaches a stage where the affected individual decides to seek medical attention. For individuals with more severe impairment, lifespan is shortened due to compromised cardiorespiratory function. This concludes this session on limb girdle muscular dystrophy. In the next segment, we will look at an eclectic class of muscular dystrophies with some general similarities to one another. These are the congenital muscular dystrophies.